President Biden also wants to highlight the mental toll of war on service members and veterans. We see in the shocking and stunning statistic that should give pause to anyone who thinks war can ever be low grade, low risk or low cost. 18 veterans on average who die by suicide every single day in America. Not in a far off place, but right here in America. There's nothing low grade or low risk or low cost about any war. It's time to end the war in Afghanistan. Someone who's experienced that firsthand is a former Marine and best-selling author, Elliot Ackerman. He served five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he's now helped hundreds of Afghans escape. He calls it a digital Dunkirk, and here he is speaking to Harry Srinivasan about how vets like him view the end of this Afghan war. Christian, thanks. Elliot Ackerman, thanks for joining us. What had been happening with you and your friends who had served together with Afghans uh, over the past few weeks and months? I mean, who are the people that served with you? What did they do and help you with? And why was that feeling so visceral for you to respond to these folks that you might not have seen in years? You know, these are my friends. I mean, these are my war buddies. When I served in Afghanistan, I served exclusively as an advisor to Afghan special operations units. So uh, when I was in battle, I looked to my left and my right. You know, there were Afghans I was fighting alongside. And in the intervening 10 years, many of them have actually come back, come to the United States. But their, their younger brothers, their, their cousins, their families have aligned themselves with the, Af with the former Afghan government and with our country. And you know, these are people who basically ex accepted the promises that we had made them over two decades at face value and put their lives on the line uh, to make good on those promises. So at the end of the day, you, know, you, you have an obligation to help these folks. And so when you're getting calls from someone who you fought alongside saying, you know, my brother, my cousin, you know, he cannot get out, please, I need your help. You know, you're gonna help. What was their immediate fear? I mean, did they know that they were on watch lists um, as they saw, too, news of the Taliban taking over one part of the country and another city and another province? Oh, absolutely. These people, first of all, I mean, just to get tacked to the kind of the granular level of it, in Afghanistan, virtually every person who worked with the United States in any capacity from a soldier to a contractor, we as the U.S. government collected their biometric data. So their vast databases with their, you know, their fingerprints, their photos, and you name it. And that biometric data is in the hands of the Taliban right now. So these are people who cannot hide. They can't just make a new life for themselves in Afghanistan. Um, you know, they are marked for Taliban justice. So these folks obviously, uh, just like I would, do not want to stick around and find out what Taliban justice is going to mean for them and their families. So what did you and your friends decide to start doing? Well, pretty early on in this evacuation, um, I started, started receiving phone calls uh, about individuals organizing private flights because the government flights weren't coming, uh, weren't moving quickly enough, and there were private citizens who were willing to put up the money to fly and charter aircraft. And so we started trying to raise the money for that and started manifesting families onto these flights. Um, we were able to get a few of those flights out. Then conditions at the airport in Kabul swiftly deteriorated. So those flights became more complicated, became very difficult. You can, you can no longer bus people into the airport really after just a few days. And so frankly, what it started to deteriorate into was sort of small groups of individuals we knew about who we were trying to get out guiding them towards the various gates at the airport, whether it's Abbey Gate where the suicide bomb was, or you know the North Gate was a gate where the Marines were, we were able to get some people through, and calling our contacts uh, in the US military um, and in the intelligence community saying, you know, hey, we've got a group coming to you, you know me. Uh, so, you know, the, for instance, the battalion commander who's a colonel at the North Gate, he and I went through Quantico through our training in Quantico as Marines together. We were in our early 20s, so I've known him for years. And it was literally me reaching out to him by a text message saying, I hear you're at the North Gate. He's like, yeah, I'm there. I've got people who need your help. Okay, I'll have my Marines make sure they get in. I only bring up that personal connection because 
it shouldn't come to that. I mean, that's great that I have a personal connection and can help these Afghans, some of whom I know, most of whom I don't know, get through the North Gate. But what about the the tens of thousands of other Afghans who don't have that type of connection but have worked for the U.S.? So what I was witnessing was a complete breakdown of process. There was no process. The process was try to find an American who knows somebody, and if you're lucky, you'll be able to get onto an airplane. And when you succeeded in dribs and drabs here, did word spread? It did spread, and uh, it spread to other folks and other networks who of people who had Afghans who were seeking to, to get out, um, people I never knew. So I, I have a whole connection of folks that I've been placed in touch with who had a group of, you know, 20 individuals here who'd done human rights work who needed to get out, or, you know, 30 individuals here who had done work in, you know, entertainment that they would be punished for in the Taliban, all folks who needed to get out. And, um, you know, the, the phrase sort of a, a digital Dunkirk has been thrown around, and it very much was. It was one of these sort of Dunkirk-esque processes where everyone is is sailing across the strait on their little boat trying to just get out whomever they can. What does this do to the young Al Afghans that, you know, as you point out, I mean, if these 20 years have been this respite for them and their worldview is shaped in a totally different way than under Taliban rule, and how do they perceive this exit by the United States? I think it's a betrayal. I mean, I, I think it's a massive, it's a massive betrayal. And I think it's a betrayal that will come to haunt the United States in the long run. I think it will come to haunt the United States among an entire, what I'm certain gener is a generation of Afghans who feel as though we have turned our backs on them and have left them behind. So I think you know we're gonna be held account in that regard. And I think we're also going to be held into account with regards to our allies around the globe. I mean, this unequivocally weakens the word of the United States as a global partner and the system of you know, relative stability that we have enjoyed as Americans uh, over you know, 20, 30, however far you want to go back, I think you can even potentially go back to after the Second World War, has really in many respects been upheld by this idea that you know, America's word, American credibility stands for something. This also seems like a stress test for the institution of the U.S. military. And I mean, from the things that I read, I, I sense a disillusionment from my other veteran friends who say, well, why, why did we do this? Yeah, Harry, I think, that's, I think that's accurate. I think there are some very strong currents of disillusion that are coursing through the U.S. military right now. I don't profess to speak for the entire U.S. military, but I can just tell you what my, what my friends are talking about uh, who are on active duty, who are veterans. And when I look back at the last 20 years of war, I mean, one of the things I think that is singular about these, these wars is the way that they have been waged. You know, every conflict the U.S. has fought since its inception has had to have a construct to sustain it, a construct around blood and treasure. You know, how do we man these wars? How do we pay for them? All the way back to, you know, if we look at our own civil war, right, the construct was the first ever draft comes out of the civil war. It's actually the first ever income tax. The Second World War, you know, war bond drives, another draft. The Vietnam War was characterized by a very unpopular draft. Well, these wars, the post-9-11 wars, have been characterized by an all-volunteer military, so that's how we've done the blood, it's all-volunteer, and they've been funded through deficit spending. So there's never been a war tax. We just put it on the national credit card. And that has really insulated American society from the cost of these wars. You know, unless you have a child who's volunteer or a close family member, you, know, you don't feel them. So like, for instance, in 2018, there was a Rasmussen poll in the, during the midterm elections, and, they, and Americans were asked, is the war in Afghanistan going on? 42% of Americans couldn't even say whether or not the war in Afghanistan was still going on. That's how disconnected we had become from these wars. Now, obviously, it's very much in the headlines today. But I think what's so dangerous about this is you have a U.S. military now that has increasingly become almost like a subculture, a, you know, a, a segregated caste in American society. And if, you know, if we look back through history, you know, when you have a dynamic in a democracy or you have a very large standing military, and extremely dysfunctional politics at home. You know, democracies don't last long in that environment. And I am I'm concerned about 
as you said, you know, these currents of disillusionment or betrayal that some in the military feel, um, even, even for many of those who want the war in Afghanistan to end, and our concern is I am like, hey, you know, we have people dying there who were born the year, the, the year that the war started, but at the same time feel that sort of the haphazard manner that this was executed uh, is very concerning, and they want accountability for that. So I think, I think anytime you see that level of dissatisfaction within a military that is isolated from the society it serves, it doesn't seem to end well. And I think that is an issue that we as a country should be paying attention to, uh, but have paid very little attention to over the last 20 years. What frustrates you as a veteran? I mean, this is one campaign. This is obviously in our lifetimes. It's the longest one that we all can remember. But you've gone through your service. There are those ideals and beliefs that drew you in. And when you see what could be at least a, a phase and an outcome right now, what are you and your friends saying to each other? Well, I would say a strain, particularly in recent weeks that I've heard that I, I am sympathetic and very much agree with is uh, a call for accountability. I don't think there is any way to look at what just occurred in Afghanistan over the last three weeks of our withdrawal and to characterize it as anything but a utter debacle. And having served in the military you know, if I was a captain and I was running a live fire range and a Marine got shot on a live fire training exercise, I would be fired. I would lose my job. It would probably be a career ender for me. And we've just watched the senior ranks of the U.S. military preside over an absolute debacle in this withdrawal. You know, people like Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Jim Milley, or Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Uh, you know, and I would even see, you know, the Secretary of State. You know, this has been a, a botched withdrawal based off of, of failed policies is accountability going to come? Will people lose their jobs over this? Because they should. And if they don't, there will be no clearer evidence that at the highest levels of the US government, there exists a culture of no accountability. And that just doesn't, just doesn't concern me as a veteran. It also concerns me as a citizen, and I think it should concern all of us as a citizens. You know, we need to bring back a culture of accountability here. Well, when you talk about accountability, right now it's hard to separate that from the political lens, right? So let's say someone should be fired, but does that act, is that act prevented from saying, well, we don't want the other team to score points. Uh, it's gonna look like weakness. This is gonna head into the midterms. This is gonna change our calculus, et cetera, et cetera. Versus saying, you're responsible for this. This is unacceptable. You no longer have a job here. I totally agree. I think that's why we should be all concerned. You know, partisanship makes us dumb as Americans. It makes it it erodes the foundations of our society. It makes us Democrats and Republicans first and Americans second. And if we live in that type of society, the future of that society is dark. So if we live in a society where there is no accountability, because accountability means that you might give the other team, the other Republican or Democratic team, a win, and so no one can ever be held accountable, you know, then we are really sick and we are really in a, a terrible place as a country. The president has repeatedly said over the past few days, look, there is no good way, essentially, to exit this. Um, should we have stayed? Should we have left a some sort of a presence there? Um, because President Biden says he doesn't want to go into the next decade of committing U.S. soldiers to what seems like quicksand. It, the, we, we don't seem to have a resolution in this process of nation building that we originally said we didn't want to do, but we began doing. You know, it's very interesting. I was, as I've been thinking about this the last few days, I went back and I rewatched yeah. Secretary of State Tony Blinken's nomination video when he accepted uh, President Biden's uh, nomination to Secretary of State. And in that, he told a story of, I think it was his step-great-grandfather, uh, who was a Jewish in the Second World War. And at the culmination of the war, he was hiding from the Germans in a forest when he heard a tank. The tank rumbled past. He saw that the tank had a five-pointed white star. And he tells his, Blinken tells this very moving story of his grandfather running up to the tank, dropping onto his knees and saying the only three words in English that he knew, 
which were God bless America and this American tanker jumping down and whisking his grandfather away to freedom and allowing him to live the life that he's had in his family to ascend to sec the Secretary of State. And he ended that story by saying, because that's who we are. And that story and that sense of who we are is so divorced from the policies that President Biden seems to be pursuing right now. So specific to your question, should we have stayed in Afghanistan? I think it begs a larger question was, who are we as the United States, you know, are we a country of isolationists? Do we recede within our borders when we come to people and tell them that, you know, we are your allies in pursuing a free and a democratic nation we will stand by you? Does that actually mean something? So I think, you know, when we look at Afghanistan, you know, Afghanistan in 2009, 10, 11, when I served there, it was a very different place than it was in 2017, 2018, kind of in the years where our, with, our withdrawal and drawdown began. When I was there, there were more than 150,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan, and we were fully engaged in combat operations. By 2018, you know, we had a little over 10,000 troops in Afghanistan. The Afghan National Army had greatly increased. Yes, they were actively fighting a war against the Taliban, but it was a war that they were by and large fighting and that we were doing a good job helping them fight. So I believe there are many models that would have been more beneficial to the United States long-term interest than the model that we just executed, which was you know, a Bosch withdrawal and uh, here's hoping that Afghanistan turns out for the best. Um, so I think with Afghanistan, I think the, the, the course we've pursued is, is cynical. Uh, if you look at you know, who we are, I don't believe it is aligned with at least what in my adult lifetime has been our American values. And I think in the long term, it's gonna be more costly for us than had we kept a de minimis force presence there and try to keep working with the Afghan government. Elliot Ackerman, author and Marine veteran, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.